Welcome back to the Chief Life Podcast. I'm Stacey Turner and I'm flying solo today because as the approach of our little bubba into Earthside arrives, Maddie and I are trying a few different things to make sure that we can still get you guys the content that you deserve and connect with all the people that we want to share with you. So today I am joined by the beautiful Dasha Leonard, formerly Dasha Omdrovchik. <laughs> and we're going to talk a little bit about the launch of your new book and how that times quite well with this month <laughs> or last month by the time you guys get to listen to this. And I guess before we delve too much deeper, can you give us a little introduction of yourself? Because I won't do you justice. I need you oh. to share your, your amazingness with the world. Okay. Where do I even start with that? <laughs> because there's so much, right? Yeah, I know. And it's all kind of labels. Yeah, really. yeah I know. <laughs> from when we have spoke last and done podcasts there's been so much that has changed totally so yeah this is actually our third podcast with you yeah so what I will start on um, and we'll align it with um, the book as well so in very brief in which we'll go into more detail around this stuff a bit later on in this in this chat um, so I grew up in Dubbo New South Wales and the biggest thing that drove my childhood and got me to where I'm at today is um, growing up in family domestic violence. Um, I used athletics and running as a way to deal with what was going on at home. By the age of 16, I studied my personal training certificate, moved out of Dubbo to Port Macquarie, <coughs> worked in gyms, started CrossFit, got hooked on CrossFit mm -hmm. and this is when I decided I want to compete in CrossFit. So after training that for a few years, I then moved up to Queensland to pursue CrossFit, find better coaches, be around more opportunity for career, lifestyle, obviously a big reason too to keep breaking the cycle of domestic violence. Um, and since then have been fortunate enough to compete at regionals four times and the CrossFit Games as a team. Yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> And what has really led me to writing the book, I knew one day that I wanted to write a book, when it was going to happen, who knew, um, but I got a call in for this in 2015, so I started writing my book, this is when my father was still alive, um, I started writing and it just did not feel right from mm -hmm. the heart, two months later, well before that I said this would be so much easier if he wasn't here, Two months later, he died. I'm like, holy shit, universe. Be careful to what me. you wish for. Uh huh. <clears throat> you need to get your message out now. You need to start serving the world. You need to be living your purpose and passion to what you truly want to do. Mm. Um, so I scratched all that writing that I did prior and started writing from the heart again. And since then, and the passing of my dad, this is where work has aligned um, in the domestic violence field where I have been coaching women, um, mentoring as well on their fitness side as well through PCYCs around Brisbane, um, taking them through a health and fitness program. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at now is really aligning my work, um, coaching and mentoring women who have gone through some form of abuse, but not only there, also through you know, building confidence and resilience for women just in general. Mm. Um, recently married, so last month, um, and I've had a baby amongst all them yeah. as well. So yeah, like they're all labels and stuff, but that's kind of like a bit of a brief about overview. Yeah, brief overview. Thank you so much for that. So I guess I want to share with everybody the name of the book because you definitely should buy a copy. It's called Beauty and Strength, Growing Beyond Family Domestic Violence. And I, I guess Dash gave us a, a beautiful overview of what kind of the book goes into, but the, I know there's a lot more depth there that we will talk about. So you run your online business, Beauty and Strength, and not only is that physical based and, and training based, but it's also very much a holistic type approach. You've also got your mindset, mm -hmm. um, shift experience type mm -hmm. program going on. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so first of all, like with Beauty and Strength, the reason why I came up with that name or why I even decided on that, and to be honest, I was even challenged by the word beauty myself mm -hmm. because, you know, when I, you know, say like five, six years ago, when I think of beauty, it was like makeup and being pretty and, you know, doing all these beauty things to your body. The kind of superficial 
stuff. Yeah, the superficial, superficial stuff, but that was never aligned with me. But then the word strength and training and being strong is so important to me and I resonate with that word so much. So beauty in strength is seeing the beauty in the strength that you have in every area of your life, whether it is training, whether it's being a mum, whether it's being a wife, whether it's just at work, it's just being the best, strongest version of yourself. But also beauty meaning deeper than your skin and strength, more than your appearance. And with clients, whether it is the training side or the mindset side, it's teaching a message that we go beyond, you know, your external appearance and your superficial world. Um, totally. So it's almost like you redefined the word beauty for yourself so that it, you gave it new meaning that was powerful. Yeah, yeah, that really resonated with me that I go, no, like I'm actually feel really good using this word beauty mm. and showing that it doesn't have, and for other clients too, that it isn't about this external appearance that we mm. tend to get caught up in, especially in the fitness industry. Mm. I might be a little biased, but I was going to say anyone that meets you would call you beautiful anyway. <laughs> so even though you don't resonate with the word, people would definitely, like so many people have said to me, oh my goodness, Dasha is stunning. <laughs> so regardless of makeup or, you know, yeah. trying to look a certain way, like you just have a natural beauty and that goes deeper than your skin, yeah. but it is also your your external appearance too. Yeah, thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm back on with Beauty and Strength. So that's how I came about the name. And when people asked about it, it's like, I wanted it to hit home. It was like, no, beauty, deeper than the skin, strength, stronger than appearance. For women and men as well mm. to go, wow, like that is so powerful. Like I love that. Mm. Um, because even for people who do get caught up in that superficial materialistic world, I think they can still resonate with that in a way because it makes them realise that, oh, deeper than my skin. Mm -hmm. um, so that really hits home. And first of all, Beauty and Strength just started out as just a 30-day fitness program and still going, um, still going strong today. And then I knew over time that I wanted to go more into the mindset coaching. Um, and when I was pregnant, I studied my life coaching course because you have time, but you don't have time as well. <laughs> but I knew I had a deadline. <laughs> By this day, this had to be achieved. Yeah. Um, and yeah, helping women who have gone through some form of abuse, or as I mentioned before, adversity, building resilience, I knew that the coaching side was what really, really made my heart sing. Like, yeah, I love the physical side, but the, if we can get into your mindset first, all your physical will happen. Mm -hmm. and being 12 years in the fitness industry, the conversations always led to, how are you feeding your mind though? What are you saying? What language are you using about yourself? Like this is what is going to be your outcome. Let the physical happen. Let the weight loss just happen. Just nourish your body through good food, good talk to yourself, good people, good environment, and life will just happen for you. Yeah, totally. Um, so whilst I was pregnant, or it might have been when Wes was just born, I put together the shift experience. <coughs> so I wanted to put a program together that gave women an opportunity to really make that shift in their lives. So I think, and I've even said it before, I'm like, I just need a shift. Or mm. I hear conversations with people and they're like, well, once this shifts, then I can do this. And that just hit home with me because I'm like, well, don't overcomplicate this. Yeah. Let me facilitate your shift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I then came up with a shift experience. So the shift experience evolved into an intense 90 day um, coaching program where I took just, take us just a small group of women because I want it to be close and intimate and be able to give them as much time as I can and really work on where they're at and get them to where they want to be, but also give them the understanding and awareness around whatever you've been through, it's not your story. Mm -hmm. If you keep living and feeding that, then yeah, that's where you're still gonna be in these 90 days and three mm -hmm. months time. Um, and the results that we achieved with that, like totally blows my mind. <clears throat> it's amazing. Because these women are literally having massive breakthroughs. Like women couldn't look at themselves in the mirror and now like, 
so freaking confident walking around beach in a bikini. Um, even things like changing jobs, was in a negative environment, left a job, coming into like starting your own business and it's totally freaking like just nailing life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and to see the shift mm -hmm. in these women, it was just like so humbling and empowering at the same time. Mm -hmm. This is my calling, this mm -hmm. is where I need to be. Um, but also, you know, I take one on one on one clients as well. And a big thing lately, as much as I've, you know, targeted women, because of course I'm a woman, that's what you're going to do. I've had multiple men reach out just on socials and be like, hey, I see that you teach women to gain authority over their emotions. What about men? I'm like, yeah, cool. Like, just because I'm going to target women doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not going to say no to a male. Mm. It's just if someone comes to you and they're like in a dark place or ready to take that next step in their life, and yeah. of course I'm going to open my arms to these people. And if they resonate with you and they feel aligned to your message, then yeah, why not work with them? And I guess the answer to some of those guys might be, well, there's already guys doing it for guys, but you know, if you have the space and the energy to, to then support these guys too, then yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, 100%. And I guess you work with women of all walks of life. So it's not just on the shift experience and through your online training programs. It's not just women who have been through domestic violence. It's mm -hmm. people from no matter what walk of life they've been through. Mm -hmm. Every one of us experiences yeah. adversity mm -hmm. on any kind of level. And sometimes, you know, relative, uh, not relatively, comparatively, some may seem worse than others, but relatively to the individual it can be pretty rough mm -hmm. and as you say it's like well what is that story no matter what your adversity has been and how can you shift it mm -hmm. to see so much improvement in your life and actually live a full and happy and joyful life that you deserve mm -hmm. so it's it's super cool that you get to work with people from all different walks of life and then as you were talking I was thinking yes like domestic violence from other people that's kind of out of your control is shit. It's awful and it shouldn't exist. And, and I love your message and how you're getting out there and trying to stop this from happening. But at the same time, there's also that self-talk mm. is, is the kind of violence that, that mm. people are giving to themselves, that inner self-critic that, and it might've been, I mean, many of the women that you've worked with, yes, they've had external abuse, mm -hmm. verbal, physical, mental, emotional, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. But they've probably then taken that story and it's become the own voice that they hear themselves say to themselves. Yeah, 100%. And I think, I don't know if it was us having this conversation, but I've recently just had that exact same conversation around, um, yeah, the physical abuse is there and the emotional and everything else. But the biggest language we talk in ourselves can be quite abusive as well. And that is the emotional and the verbal abuse. And for women in those scenarios, yes, when they are told that repeatedly, then they do lose their own self-worth, like no value whatsoever. And yes, they start to believe those names that they've been called. And yes, that's how they'll start to talk to themselves. And women and men, you know, I don't just want to block out many Half the population. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, or any gender, no matter what yeah. you choose to label yourself these days. Yes. Yeah. Um, who haven't experienced maybe so much the violence relationships or the abuse that comes with it, we can s still talk to ourselves that way. And someone who may seem like they had the perfect upbringing, the family, the parents, and all the love, can still have that as well. And it's actually an exercise that I work with with my clients is really tap into and listen to the language that you're using towards yourself. And, you know, I don't have it perfect. There are days where I think I'm shit or, you know, I may say things to myself, but I'm trying to, you know, catch it straight away, be aware of it, and then go, okay, let it go. No, you're not. Mm -hmm. Or find another word that resonates with me that's also the other side of like, I got this, I am mm -hmm. strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and I guess you might not believe it at first, yeah. but at least if you have a tool in your toolbox that allows you to first have the awareness, second to try and flip it on its head, over time, hopefully yeah. you, then, you then start to believe it more. 
the more you say it. Yeah, 100%. And it is, it's that pattern and it is breaking that habit to reform a new habit. Mm, absolutely. And the positive habits are a lot harder than the negative habits. Yeah, <laughs> they are. And also, I mean, you know, how you're saying, yes, it, you're, you're not perfect and you're still working through that process and I think we all will be forever because it's just this ebb and flow mm -hmm. I feel like once you're enlightened you probably aren't on this planet anymore you get to go into the next realm or whatever <laughs> whatever you believe in um, but also there's other things that can affect it right so you know some days you're exhausted because your 15 month old hasn't slept so you know some days you do have the strength to be able to go yeah, no, I, I've got this shit. And then other days you work your butt off and you get to the end of the day or even the afternoon or just after lunch, you're like, I've done so much today. Mm. Give, 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 give. I haven't even stopped to think about what I'm doing. And that's when those, those voices yeah. come because you haven't even had a chance to give yourself that love. Yeah. And so to then go through that, you know, if you're tired, if you haven't eaten and there's all yes. these necessities that, that we need as humans. Mm -hmm. And even that is a form of self-love, just like checking mm -hmm. in with the basic necessities and then it probably becomes easier to use a language use, yeah, that gives back to you. Yeah, and I think that's a big thing why I, why I do focus on the training and the mindset because, yeah, you can do one and not the other, but if you want to actually optimise your life in your highest potential, then having the both is going to, like, overpower that mm. <coughs> yeah absolutely um and then when you do look at what's my nutrition like what's my sleep like what am, how am i fueling my body how am i nourishing myself if you're not looking after all those others then yes that negative self-talk comes in so much and when we are at our weakest and i don't mean our mindset at our weakest but through like our nutrition our sleep like not feeling a hundred percent internally our body starts to slow down mm -hmm. and then because of the mind is always going it overpowers mm -hmm. and that's where you really start to think low on yourself um so part of you know they're i wouldn't say non-negotiables because you know <coughs> everyone's so different <laughs> not going to put that on people but they do see that the training is such an important part and then by the end of the night day it's like see why I'm pushing you to do some form of exercise, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't have to be crazy. I'm saying walk around the block and you'll feel much happier. Mm -hmm. Walk to you at the end of the driveway and get some sun and when you've done a little bit of movement, you will feel happier. Yeah. And then your thoughts then change because you're looking at the world in a different way because you're looking after yourself and that's where it creates the ripple effect. Um, and that's why I would preach, are you training? Are you eating well? Are you sleeping well? Are you working on your personal development? It is all, you know, this whole, and even nowadays everyone's so much more aware of this stuff, but um, if you're holistically looking after yourself, that's where you can really take your life to the next level. Yeah, totally. I've also noticed recently, and maybe more so with guys, I mean, I'm definitely seeing it with girls as well, and with guys I kind of let it go a bit more because there is that testosterone, that is that like animal instinct with guys a little bit more, but, that, that need to smash themselves at training. Like, mm. that, excuse my language, but that need to fuck themselves up. Um, I don't know why I'm apologizing. We always run our podcast, so it's only if you're listening to it with your child. I apologize for that. But um, yeah, it's, I, I feel like having transitioned from being somebody who was right up there with all the intensity and needing to, I don't know if I ever needed to smash myself. I don't know, maybe I did. It was, mm. it was my personality back then. But as I've transitioned into this kind of slower, very calm kind of, Mm. less intense way of moving my body each day and then when I hear people I reflect and I'm like are they doing it because they feel good or are they doing it to punish themselves mm. and are mm. you seeing a similar thing with with the ladies that you've been working with in the shift experience yeah 100% um, and I will also add to that like I can really relate with that because going through what I went through training was an outlet mm. um, and because there was the physical violence but also like this inner strength and this mental toughness to push my body so hard mm. was what I really 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 wanted to do mm. and no it wasn't healthy because mm. I ended up getting sick mm. or and training yeah 100% your whole immune system goes down 
and when you actually figure out why you did that, then it makes sense. And then you just take a different level and intensity in training. It may still be hard, but be different. Mm. So I guess the intention changes. Yeah, hundred percent. And if you don't quite know your why, I think um, you know that's where we can get caught up in the pushing yourself. The ego comes in, and all that stuff kind of takes control as well. But I can definitely relate to people who do want to use training in a punishing sense mm. but I can only relate with that if there had been like a bit of trauma um, like loss adversity um, because I think there's a there's a massive deep underlying, underlying reason why yeah so and only because that was my why and I pushed my body so hard to build my physique to be ready to take my dad at any point mm. in whatever way I can mental strength physical strength you hit a wall. When you hit a wall, you got to kind of look at your life and yeah. go, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Why am I put up with this? Why am I sick? Now I can't train, so that defeats the purpose. Mm -hmm. like, okay, I've got to find a smart way. And that was the, I guess the next intention for me was, okay, I understand why. Maybe you're doing that because you're still going through letting go of childhood shit. Mm. Okay, don't remanage your present, don't remanage your training. You enjoy training because you actually enjoy it, you love it. And you're competing now, so if you're training for performance, there needs to be a reason in how you're training, your intensity, your recovery, your sleep, your nutrition, like everything again. Yeah. And then when you can understand that, it's like, okay, I don't need to flog myself. If yeah. I flog myself, where is the enemy? Yeah. Down in the dumps. Sometimes less is more. Yeah. And even being in tune with your moods. Like, I can't even remember exactly, but I'm sure I would have been on edge. I'm sure I would have been, like, really snappy. Um, and Some I people get aggressive yeah. with their training. And, yeah. yeah, 100%. So with the women on the shift experience or with my clients, and this is just from lessons that I've learned as well, like, I am more training intuitive. Mm. listen to your body yeah I still and we have the hormonal cycle that you know guys are on a 24 hour cycle we're on like a 28 to 32 day some of us some of us are a bit more skewed with like yeah so there's so much going on that yeah intuitive training makes so much sense to yeah. check in each day and you can still train hard but your intent and intensity is just for that moment mm. and for the purpose of if it is competition just being healthy or you're also like just to push yourself hard. Mm. I think that's the real challenges. Thing. Yeah, it's a real thing too. And to get if we're really nutted out and talk about if well if you want to get results, you gotta push that hard. Yeah. It's actually true. Yes. You do. Stress to progress, but good stress. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Um so with the women it's like I just want you to train not when, like, when feels right for you, but train at the intensity that feels right for you. Yeah. It may not be every day. One day you might do 10 minutes, the next day you might do 20, the next day you might do a walk or mm. some core work. Yeah. It doesn't have to be this hardcore intensive kind of training, um, but you just need to move your body. Yeah. And training intuitive, which I'm so all about myself mm. nowadays, is actually give me so much more success in mm -hmm. getting fitter and stronger mm -hmm. um, than going in and flogging myself. Yeah, and that takes a lot of practice. Hey, it allows you to get so much more out of your training, but at the same time, so many people are used to following the program, in inverted commas, or mm -hmm. having the coach tell them what to do, but the coach doesn't feel what you feel. Mm -hmm. So you know your body, like, you know, whoever you are, you know your body better than anyone. Mm. But learning how to listen to those signs mm. takes a lot of practice. Mm. And so I'm mean, like there's something that you would lead people through and like learning how to mm -hmm. tune into that and, and what questions to ask yourself. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I was gonna mention was that your intention or your why changed again because after you'd done mm. your training for performance, you were then pregnant and yeah. you then had a baby. So I guess then the focus is definitely not to flog yourself because you're trying to grow another human. Yes. And so you're just training for health at that mm. point. Yeah. So even like looking back on this now, it's my like training has really changed, which has meant I've had to make the mindset shift along the way. Mm. And it's actually been really, really good life lessons because, you know, 20 year old me 
not that I ever wanted to get pregnant at that age, ever, um, <laughs> would not have been okay with slowing it down mm. and listen to my body. It's like, no, this is what I've got to do. I'm going to yeah. go as hard as I can. Yeah. Um, I'm as strong and fast yeah. as the boys. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, but yeah, your, your life goes the path that it does and not that you don't have any other choice to like, make that decision, but you also evolve and you grow and from those lessons you learn, okay, I can't hold myself doing this forever, I'm going to be injured. I'm mid-twenties now and then I'm late-twenties and then I'm thirty. Like, you've got to get real but also play it smart and um, yeah, falling pregnant, well prior to that I had a um, slight back injury that made me <laughs> stop and I literally could not lift any weight for almost six months. It was just body weight and that makes you really appreciate where you're at and the way that you are training and makes you appreciate the basics. And I even say that to my clients, it's like, well, where are your basics at? Like, should you be dead deadlifting? Have you, can you hold a plane for two minutes before you like start adding load to your body? Mm -hmm. Like get real, get real with where you're at, then start to move on and then you progress and then you get to success. Yeah. The basics may not be sexy, yeah. but they are foundational. <laughs> 100%, and it will help you be sexy. Yeah. Like, later on. <laughs> Um, and yeah, training whilst pregnant was, I, I think I trained so intuitively then mm. because I guess another thing in my mind was like, oh my God, I don't want to have my back. I don't want to be doing this. And it really was just for health and fitness and it slowed my body down in a way of just accepting and being and being present and being in the moment mm -hmm. and really just enjoying training for what it is Yeah, and really brought me back to like, I love training, this is why I do it. Not to punish myself, not because of childhood stuff, not because of competition, not because someone thinks I should. It was all internal, like, you know what, I train for me, mm -hmm. my mental health, because mm -hmm. that helps so mm -hmm. much, like it does make you feel good. But also, um, being healthy and fit throughout pregnancy was important to me. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I think I didn't train like so many weeks at the start. Like I was so externalised from like myself and wanting to do anything yeah. that I only like went when I felt like it yeah. and did not put any pressure on myself on like, oh, I should be training and I can't believe I've only trained once this week. Whereas like a few years ago I would. Mm -hmm. Throughout pregnancy it's like, man, I'll just get to the gym when I get to the gym. Yeah. I'll do ten minutes, I'll do twenty minutes. Yeah. Like, do I'll some air squats at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel ya. <laughs> yeah. I'm five months now and my workout has been thirty air squats <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I get home with the rest of my day. <laughs> it's so true. And I guess for us comparing it to what we were doing, like I went and saw the Cairo yesterday to because my tailbone's fucking painful and everything's out of alignment. Mm. Um, and he's like, I guess comparing it to what you were doing mm. compared to what you are doing now. And my ego doesn't care. It's gone. Yeah. It's not worried about this. But the physical unloading yeah. on your body. So it's not just the pregnancy that you're dealing with. It's also the transition of training. So even if you weren't pregnant, if somebody's gone from, like no matter who you are, if you have gone from training at a very high level, lifting heavy weights, mm. high intensity, and then you back off because you need to yeah. and you want to, mm. there's going to be so many physiological changes that happen in your body that would be happening regardless of whether there were pregnancy hormones and then the pregnancy hormones on top right. of that adds yeah. a whole new layer. Well, um, the biggest shift and um, transition I had was like becoming a mum mm. and getting back into training mm. and what that looked like what that looked like for me going forward because of where I had been prior. Yeah. Um, and that was probably, I wouldn't say the biggest challenge, but it was something that really grated on me mm. that I had to not come to terms, but accept in a way of this is just where you're at. Like you've just had a fucking child. Yeah. You just pushed out a fucking kid. Yeah. There's a lot going on down yeah. there. <laughs> Give it time. Yeah. There's no rush to get back into the yeah. gym. But because my whole life I've used it in a way to self-medicate, it's like, oh my God, now I've got this baby and I can't go and smash myself at the gym. Yeah. Like, what endorphins am I going to get now? How am I going to get that? Um, 
but yeah, my biggest transition to come from you know pregnancy to being a mum was like, okay, well, who am I now? Mm. And because there was such an identity around Dasha the CrossFit or Dasha the athlete, and I always say like I wasn't ever so attached to that where that was like my everything and this is my life forever. Always had a life outside of CrossFit. Yeah, always believed in that. Um, but it was like because this is I've competed for the last six or seven years and mm. I've gone to regionals and I've gone to the games and I've been able to do all this stuff to like being at home and trying to be my own motivation and not being able to lift the things and do all the movements and not even, I didn't actually really get to the gym until I think it was like nine or ten weeks because I, and I believe in doing the work, I did all the core and strength and stretch work at home yeah. prior. Yeah, we did a beauty and strength cycle together actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, was, it was actually perfect for my recovery. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to make sure that that was all like strong and good to go because once I started lifting weights, I didn't want my body in any complications um, coming back because I wanted to go, okay, like, I don't care how slow I'm going. I know it's going to get better three months, six months, 12 months. And it was so different in 12 months. Um, but that takes a lot. Like I definitely got, was challenged by it. Mm. And, um, my beautiful friend Rach, she helped me kind of see it from a different view and the label we put on it, mm. so we didn't need labels, but you know, it really helped me understand and help me remove from the athlete identity to yeah. um, I'm a high, high performance human. Mm. I was like, wow, like I am, I'm a high performance human. Yeah, like, yeah I am. <laughs> I just like challenging my body in ways so I can be a better person and a better human. Not necessarily need to get back to where I was, I need to get back to regions, I need to get back to the game. It's yeah. like, yeah, that stuff's awesome and if that ever come up again, it came up again. But what my priority now is being a mum, you know, giving the best I can to my family and that meant training when I could and just fueling myself and my satisfactions through training for a healthy way, yeah. not out of like, I need to now prove something mm. to the world, to the community that I'm coming back like this. Cause like now I'm pretty much there. Mm. It just hasn't bothered me, Yeah. but definitely um, the identity shift was something I challenged, was challenged by, but was able to really understand it and not get attached to it and it's different for everyone mm. I don't know being a mum you do feel it, it's I think it's common for every mum to feel their identity goes like well who am I now mm. and what do I do and I did coach so much and I was around people all the time now I'm inside and shit I have cabin fever like mm -hmm. your mindset goes through so much mm. and that's this is when I really delve into beauty and strength and started my shift experience like I had so much going on and I was writing my book and I needed to get my book finished before she was born um, in Feb 2018 and it was finished before that but I'm like I put a lot of pressure on myself to have all these things done before she was here but I'm actually glad I did because I struggled when she was a newborn into that transition but mm. also going kind of like I had so much freedom and independence. Mm. Like, what am I doing? Now life? I have a dependent human. Yeah, all the time. <laughs> it was a massive shit. I still, and I'm so open about it. I am still challenged so many ways today since becoming a mum. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's the best thing and you love it. And like, of course, I don't say of course it is, but like, it is. Mm. It absolutely is. But I'm also fucking real. Mm. And I'll, I just give truth yeah. to how I feel. and is like one of the most challenging things I've ever fucking gone through. Yeah. And personally, you know, growing up the way that I did, creating family was so freaking important to me. And, um, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, don't be in a rush to change the past and this and that, but it's like, man, I have no one I wanted since I was like 15. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I know, I've been working, towards, been working towards this for many, many years. Yeah. Um, and now that it's here, a lot of my past crept into the now 
around this whole family thing. Mm. Like, I'm like I'm triggered, like triggered from my mom, triggered from my dad. Like stuff comes up in the family. Like in all honesty, like your relationship takes a bit of a toll. You don't start loving each other, but you're just like, wow, like now there's a other priority in us. Yeah, we gotta work a bit harder. Yeah, and we've gotta communicate on a deep level there and over communicate on every thought that comes in. And what did you think about that? And what did you think about that? It's like, man, this is so much work. <laughs> so there's so many different levels of um, accepting and also you stepping up as a person, you stepping up as a parent, you stepping up as a mother, you stepping up as your higher self because you are the leader, a role model, like your babies look to you like freaking everything, they sponge off you, mm. not off you, they sponge, like yeah, they absorb they everything, absorb everything. Yeah. so that shift for me has been the biggest, despite like even going through my childhood stuff, all competition stuff, yeah. I'm like wow, now I'm a mother and it's challenging. Mm. And I, yeah, I hear, completely hear you, I think a lot of people assume that challenge and hard are bad words. And it's like going back to how you had defined beauty as a word that didn't really resonate with you. Mm. And I've recently been playing with this idea of that hard is not a bad thing if you don't let it be a hard thing. Like what story do you attach to the concept? So like the first three months of pregnancy were fucking hard, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't change it for the world because mm -hmm. I'm so excited to be a mum. Yeah. I wanted to experience the full roller coaster. I want to be a doula one day. I want to help other women yeah. to get pregnant and experience the same thing. So I need to feel all the feels. Yeah. So I know what it's like to go through it all so I can then help people who are also going through the same thing. And I mean, you know this a million times over, anything worth doing requires effort. Yeah. Anything worth doing is going to be a challenge. Mm. And that's probably why fitness programs, nutrition programs, all get the label challenge. Yeah. Because it's meant to be hard. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Yeah. But I think now it's been given this misconception of challenge is an excuse to get onto a program, do something for 30 or 60 or 90 days, and then just go back to what they were doing before. Yeah. So it, I think it's people like you and, and people in our industry that are trying to work to change the perception of the word challenge even. Yeah. It's, it's not a negative, it shouldn't have negative connotations. It should be this beautiful rite of passage. 100%. And it is always a perception. Yeah. What, it, what does that word what mean? What does that word mean? What, how does it trigger you? Yeah. Like, words <laughs> trigger. Like, how does challenge, like, yeah. how does it trigger you? What is yeah. that? Like, how does that trigger you? And I think for ages I hated the word challenge because I was running nutrition challenges. Or yeah. well, people were coming to us and saying, can you run a nutrition challenge? I say, I'll call it a program yeah. and then I'll do it. <laughs> because I don't want people thinking that they come on and they do this 30 or 60 days mm. and then they go off and they yeah. let it all go again. It's mm. integration and, and changing habits and mindset shift. Yeah. And, you know, the new practices. Life. So anyway, yeah, we could go on about this all day. So you and I might need to cut up on the, on the time that we talk for. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, like, obviously there's a lot that you delve into in the book. What would you say your key message is that you're trying to get out? Mm -hmm. um, my key message in the book or, like, just in life in general is... Oh, higher person. Yeah. No matter where you come from or what, or what you've been through, you can achieve anything you want in the world. And to not fall victim of your story, use it to empower yourself and everyone else around you. Mm. Um, yeah, that would probably sum it up. And in my book, it's, in it's broken down into two parts. So the first part is about the home life. And literally, like the first chapter, maybe the second, um, is just about the home life and what I experienced as a child and what it felt like for me from my from my perspective, mm. not from anyone else's. Mm. Um, and then it really just goes on into my sport and how I kind of started using that and flipped that around. And then my time in Port Macquarie, um, losing my dad, having a miscarriage, and then the second part is all the lessons and all the positive things that's come from it and what to expect from someone that has gone through abuse as a child or you know partnership and how to love because it's hard to love when you come from this stuff um, so the book isn't really this deep down on domestic violence it's really to shine a light on what can be such a dark topic for people yeah. um, because I grew up 
being told keep your mouth shut, never say anything, it's not common to talk about it and now we're hearing about it freaking everywhere mm. and there's so many incidences mm. happening, it's like blows my mind the shit that's happening um, but it is happening, it's real, it's out there, it is in your face sometimes but what about why kind of be in our face around shit, did you hear about that program that help this community mm. and all these women now are training and they're all empowering each other and they've all got clothes on their back and they've all got somewhere to live. Um, they're all breaking the cycle that we're now teaching kids how to love each other. Mm. We're now teaching boys love, you know, mm -hmm. and giving love. Um, so yeah, the book is in this deep dive around domestic violence, such a bad thing, how shit is it for me that I experienced this. <coughs> I don't think you've ever been <coughs> one to go into the victim mindset. <laughs> it's really to flip it around and go, mm. it can be broken. Mm. The cycle can be broken if you want it to. Mm. And I think bringing stories out like this is empowering, if I must say so. It is empowering yes. because, like, I know myself, I think I only know of two or three other books that are on domestic violence. Mm. Yeah, there aren't many out there. Yeah, like there's not heaps. So I'm like, if this can be an educational tool to schools and to services around, okay, there is light, there is change. She, she did go through this, but now she's achieved this. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, okay, look at me, look at what I've achieved. It's like, no. You can fucking do it. Yeah. If you really want to, you will. Yeah. Like, honestly, no matter your background or what you have gone through, there is change. There is hope out there. There is support. Mm -hmm. And there really is. There's always been support. Yeah. It's whether you're really wanting to step into that, yeah. whether you're open to it in the first place, mm -hmm. and if you're really willing for that internal change. Mm -hmm. um, and when I take on clients, I'm actually very honest and like brutally honest right from the start like I'm not here to fuck around I'm here to like really help you change your life yeah let's, and just get, let's get this show on the road <laughs> yeah and if you really are willing to go to those dark places really open like ready to face your insecurities your demons be faced with all of your shit yeah then let's work together because yeah. if you're not then we're I'm probably not <laughs> yeah, and we're probably gonna go round and round and round in circles for ages. Yeah, because you're not ready to do the deep dive work that yeah. we're ready to do, and that's okay mm. as well because we're all on our journey. Mm -hmm. And that conversation may open up other things for three or six months or twelve months later. Yeah, plant the um, seed. Hundred mm. percent. But yeah, breaking the cycle is achievable. Can be achieved through anyone freaking hard mm. your environment is everything especially for women who are still in it or kids that are still around other family members who are quite negative it's hard to break those patterns but it, because i am a walking a living example yeah example of it mm. it is hard um and yeah falling victim to me just doesn't ever cross my path into any area of my life that i ever want to fall in yeah. But in saying that, because it's a ingrained kind of, you know, habit from a young age, mm. right? Like, oh, well, you're a victim. And even society puts the label on mm. it, or like, she's a victim because she's gone through that. Mm -hmm. Like, I honestly I actually feel that's downgrading. Mm -hmm. um, at one stage in their life, yes, mm -hmm. but forever, no. Mm -hmm. But personally, if you are choosing the victim story of yourself, the poor me, I had it hard, or you don't know what it was like, I had it tougher. Well, sorry, but that still is playing the victim. Mm -hmm. And that does only get you so long and so far in life. And for some, you know, it's 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, then they do start to realise that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, strong believer in do not fall the victim of your story or your past. Yeah, take action, get out of there mm -hmm. as best you can, find yeah. the support. Yeah. So this is something that you obviously talk about in the second half of your book is like the biggest lessons. And I guess your lessons then become messages of advice to other people and, and that's definitely a lot of what, what your book 
kind of dives into and shares with people. So again, I don't want to share everything because yeah. I want them to, to buy it and to receive the messages for themselves. But maybe if there was like one piece of advice that you could give to somebody who is in a similar scenario to what you were to be able to mm. like help them get out of it if they want to. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, we'll do that first and then I'll ask you the second question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I would say, so are they a child? Like, are they young? I guess if yeah, 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 it would be yeah, um, similar to age. age. Yeah. So I would say find something that you enjoy doing around fitness. I just always fall back to fitness because it was such a huge part. Mm. And for some it's singing. Yeah, you know, I was going like, to say it could be music, could it could music. be art. Yeah, like find a way to express yourself. Because mm. as a child growing up in that, you feel like you can't express yourself. Mm. You can't express your emotions. You can't express your personality. You don't even know what your personality is on mm. a you know, depth mm. level of it. So when you find something that you enjoy, whether it be creative or sports or arts, you then come out into your own person a little bit. Yeah. And then gradually and over time, you start to see the world differently because now you're doing the things that you start to enjoy, mm. which also start to bring better people into your life. Yeah. Um, and then your conversation changes with those people. So instead of it being around a negative environment at home, if that is the scenario, you're having conversations with other people who do fitness, who talk about health and positive life. Other people in arts and craft, they talk about their vision. You know, so then you start to adopt how other people are living. Not that you're comparing or being trying to be the same, but I can assure you, you will start to look at your own life and go, wow, like, am I doing this? Or like, oh my God, this makes me feel so happy. I'm going to do it. Wow, that guy or that girl, she's really happy. I want to know, or, or I want to be around her more. Mm. So if someone's in that position, try and find something that you just enjoy doing that brings joy into your life. Yeah. Find a support environment, network mm. that you actually trust mm. being around. And be open to going to DV shelters and calling, like seriously. I know a lot of people can say, oh, like you've run for ages and like, oh, they don't help you. They do help and that's why they're there. Mm-hmm. So call a lifeline, call DV Connect, call these numbers and tell them your situation. As hard as it is, reaching out is a big step, yeah. but it's the most important step that you can take in pushing your whole life forward. Yeah. So find something that you enjoy doing reach out, find a supportive network mm. in whatever capacity. Mm. It could be friends, it could be these support networks that are around nowadays. Yeah. Um, even, even if they're in school, there might be someone that they can yeah. talk to at school, confide yeah. in. 100%. Um, yeah, that'll probably be my main ones. Yeah. Just because if you just did those, everything else will start to come as well. Yeah. And when you are in those situations, if someone was saying, hey, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do, it becomes too overwhelming. And even working with um, the women, like when they have been in these situations, I'm like, man, we just need to pull it back to basics. Mm-hmm. What time are you going to bed? Mm-hmm. Midnight. Cool, let's try 10 o'clock. Mm-hmm. Like basic, basic, basics. Mm-hmm. So we don't have to overcomplicate it and be like, I need to shift my whole yeah, life and I need to move and this needs to happen. It's like, no, cool, what do you enjoy doing? Oh, dance and cool, do you do any dance classes? No. Cool, what's in your area? Oh, this, this. Cool, I drive past it every day. Oh, awesome, can you drop in? Yeah. Like, cool, let's go and do that. Open up the opportunity. Yeah, so it's just little movements like that can have such a huge impact on pushing your life forward. And and I always fall back to this as well, environment was so huge for me. I had people around me who like loved me mm. and pulled me into their family and I'm just like man if you can find someone or a few people that you feel like you can trust mm. and trust is such a big thing we don't trust straight up mm. it's still like it's still something that I struggle with and I don't mm. trust straight up I need to see your actions and do your actions along with your words mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know it will take time to gain that trust but um, they having people around you 
will help you um, see life for really what it is. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, I mean, you did find those people who you were able to connect with and who you found that love from. But you stepped into that, like you yeah. took the action to find those people as well. It's not like you were actively looking, but you yeah. you, you left the, the difficult situation that you were in mm. to go and find new opportunities. Mm. So mm. it will it will take some courage um, yeah. from people. And I think even that advice, I know we were talking about somebody who would have been in a similar situation to yeah. you around that, you know, same age, but I think that would work for adults too, yeah. find something you find joy in and, yeah. and find somebody you can confide in. And that's a good yeah. start. Mm. So then my other question on from there is, okay, maybe somebody hasn't been in a, a d- domestic violence situation, but what can they get out of reading your book? Like what's their lesson? What's, what's mm. the advice to those people? Yeah. So similar. Whatever your story is that you're telling yourself that's not allowing you to move forward in the life that you actually want to live rewrite your story Mm -hmm. because you are in control of that story and like I've written mine like I rewrote it Mm. I started it in the first chapter but I rewrote it and when you get to the end it's completely different to how it started yeah So I've had to rewrite my story to get to where I'm at today. Mm -hmm. So whether you have experienced loss, trauma, um, self-abuse, self-abuse, you've left a job just because you want more change. If you're in a bit of a career hole and looking to reach out, you know, take that leap and reading it will empower you to be like, man, if she can do it through that, I can do it through this. Mm -hmm. Awareness is such a big thing. So listen to the thoughts and the story that you are telling yourself over and over in your head and just ask yourself the truth. Mm -hmm. Is this story I'm telling myself true? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. Do I need to do something about this? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Then you are just making it up in your head. Yeah. So when you actually get clear and bring it back to basics, you can then get rid of yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, the book will also allow you to just accept who you are Mm -hmm. for where you are Mm -hmm. in life. And time's not over. Like we've all got time to change. We've all got time to do the things that we want to do. Um, Just got to get out and do it. So I think, yeah, if someone hasn't experienced any of that, I feel like it would just empower them to rewrite their story yeah. and own that, own who you are. Time to, time to step out of that comfort zone. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Be okay with being a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> so now that you're a published author... Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Another label. <laughs> yeah, totally. What are your favourite <coughs> books? What are, like, I know it's hard to kind of... I never ask people what their favourite one book is because mm. it's hard to na- nail it into one, but... What are a couple of your favourite ever books that you feel like have played a part in, in changing your story, mm. in moulding your life? Yeah. Um, I always come back to a couple for this one because I read a few books quite early on. I actually share them in my book, mm. um, a few that I rec- recommend. The first one is called... This is such like an easy read. Like Seriously, if you've got like half an hour, you can knock it over in half an hour. And it's so simple, like words are even a bit on the page, so mm. you don't have to worry about small writing. Is it on audiobook though, for the people that don't like to read words? It probably is. It's called The Rhinoceros Success. Ah. And uh, I read this, this was the very first book that I was given. I was like 17. And it made me look at who I was hanging around with, like what um, crowd and tribe and people mm. and animals I was kind of mm. hanging around. and what the book is about, it talks about all the animals and who the rhinos are, who the eagles are, who the lions are, who the sheep are, Mm -hmm. you know, are you flocking around with the sheep or are you flying high with the eagles, are you taking charge with the lions and the rhinos and it just made me assess my um, surroundings and environment of people and I always keep like a bit of a small circle but am quite friendly and able to build friendships with a lot of people um but there's 
some who I'll be really close with and others that I go, you know what, love you as a person, but we're just not vibing. Mm. Um, and that is okay as well, because mm. everyone is different. So it just made me look at who I surround myself with and another uh, one quote that I believe is, um, you're the average of five people you surround yourself with. Okay, cool, who's my five? Yeah. Am I raising them up? Are they raising me up? Or am I the average of who they are? And then is what they're doing aspiring me? Not that it may be less or worse, are they aspiring me to be a better person? Yeah. Yes, cool, keep hanging out with them. No, okay, recess, <laughs> time to move on. Um, so that made me look at my whole environment in that way. And if you're, I guess, even early on in your journey of self development, or you know that you're not in your best environment, that would be like a really good way to just kind of assess with you, where you're at yeah. and start thinking differently, mm. which then your actions will align with that, and then other things will happen as well. But that one, and um, the power of now was such a big one for me with Eckhart Tolle mm. because I was always living in my head, mm. always thinking of my future, never wanted to be in the present moment. Mm didn't know how to be in the present moment, yeah. was so in the past or, and the victim mindset of this happened to me, I went through this, I'm this way because of this and I don't really recommend that book if um, you've read a few other kind of personal yeah, development books because it's quite deep and um, yeah, it can put you on like a bit of a whirlwind with yeah. the book, yeah. um, you do have to be ready for it, yeah. the person is going to give it to me decided to not at that time and give it to me like it was thinking my way three or six months later yeah we felt that I wasn't ready I feel like the book finds you at the right time as well yeah because when we met you'd read it and you were raving about it and I hadn't even heard of it yet yeah that's um, right. and yeah, I yeah and then I ended up listening to it because I was doing my bodybuilding prep and yeah. I was listening to it while I was walking each morning yeah and so it, yeah. it finds you I think when you're ready to listen to it so if you're hearing this now and you're like oh that sparked the interest yeah. And maybe now is the time for you to read that book. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but that was such a good one for me just in that moment because as deep as it goes, the biggest takeaway was understanding past, present, future. Yeah. And where am I living? Yeah. Where is my ego living? And one of the biggest things that I remember when we first started hanging out was your favourite quote at that time was be where your feet are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, be where your feet are. Because if you wear your feet are, you're not anywhere else. Yes. And you're present and you're Yeah, and she said that to someone the other day and I'm like, Oh my god, like I actually have nothing else to say to that. Yeah. Like, yeah, because it's kind of true. It's yeah. like, hey, just be really like, oh, I'm here. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. And I haven't read Rhinos for Success, so I'll have to check that yeah, out. Yeah, good one. <laughs> easy read, very easy read. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, I feel like you and I could keep talking for hours, so I'm going to wrap it up because I'm sure we can do another one at some stage. But um, is there anything else that you wanted to share about the book or about? Uh, services that you provide mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. just you know parting knowledge from the yeah. world of Dashmi. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah I guess why this month is so important for me um, so it's family and domestic violence prevention month here in Queensland. Um, I learned my book launch with this month to really get the word out as much as I can. I've also had a few other events throughout the month raising awareness um, to this cause and yeah there's there's big changes happening in the domestic violence world and like I'm in it and it's even been a bit of a shift for me to go like I'm forever my past is forever brought up um, <coughs> which can be challenging mm -hmm. because I am speaking about it a lot more yeah you can't and I, the door on yeah, it. Mm. yeah, and I am getting asked to speak and share my story, so I am constantly replaying the events and scenarios in my head. Um, so for anyone that is going through it, it's okay to keep talking about it. Don't ever feel you just have to close the door and that's it. Can't ever be brought up again. There's different levels of healing, and like. I'm still healing, like writing the book was part of healing, mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. having the book launch was part of the healing, like all these little things are still happening for my healing process to um, allow and that is okay. So if it 
is domestic violence or sexual abuse or whatever it may be like it is okay to feel the way that you are feeling it is okay to keep healing we are going to keep healing there's so many levels of it there is change happening so many more people are aware of it so many organizations so many companies are getting onto that i've heard i didn't know about this but someone again sparked my memory about it in companies and organizations now you can now take dv leave mm. so they're allowing up i think it might be allowing up to 10 days that if you are or a family member is experiencing family or domestic violence you are allowed to take paid leave wow. i think that's pretty awesome it is awesome that they've made that available mm. the thing that crosses my mind is that it sucks it has to be a thing that it exists <laughs> but it's awesome that because it's a thing these companies are supporting those that are going through it 100 percent. i know mm. yeah that's, that's always the trade-off even a couple of events that i have gone to this year i'm oh, sorry this month already we are talking about how many lives have been taken mm. and you go and it's just increasing. Mm. Um, what month are we? Where am I? Just end of May now. Yeah. There's already 25 or 26 females being murdered this year oh, already. So, like, we're counting, that's not even the children, we're counting the lives. So, when these events are on, they're remembering how many numbers. Mm. I would love to see it get to a point where you're not counting anymore, you're still mm -hmm. having the events, but you're celebrating the lives. Mm -hmm. But still that's, get to be lived. Yeah, yeah. And still celebrating those lives that have gone. And celebrating the ones that are able to live mm. and are empowering and are sharing their stories. And yeah. it become like, you know, a distant memory. A remembrance day yeah. for it rather than, oh, 50 this year. And like, oh, 70 this year. And like, shit, three this month. Yeah. So. Because it shouldn't be happening at all. Yeah. And it is common, but people like myself and all these organizations they're doing amazing things and you guys listen to this podcast or reading my book whatever it may be like you are part of the change yeah and you're supporting the cause 100 yeah. percent, and that's such a that's so important for me and i find that so humbling because you know and even stay you stay sort of doing this podcast like throughout this month like we really want to you know to get this done this month to keep raising awareness and no, it's not just this month that we talk about it. We can talk about it over time. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, there is just a lot going on around domestic and family violence at the moment that we are able to speak about it a yeah. little bit more to bring as much awareness around. But you are part of the change. You're part of a bigger movement. And even if you haven't experienced it, like it's, this shit's real. It is out there. And if this is the first time you've been exposed to it, you know, chat to someone about it, ask about it, become aware of it, because the more awareness we have, then the better we can make the world. And even for our youth, like the youth is the change, the youth is the future. This book or podcast or anything can get to a child or, you know, in those teenage years, then that's where we can really change this course. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So buying your book, attending if you're in brisbane attending any of dasha's book launch events and that will actually contribute to the charity that you support so the mm. allison baden clay foundation yes yeah. um and if you if you buy the book but you want to assist more and you're not able to get to any of the events then definitely jump on and donate to that foundation. Mm -hmm. They've got their own website where you, yeah, can, for sure. you can donate straight to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want to buy Dasha's book, you can order it from in-house publishing's website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's also, there's an e-book version on Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Is there or you can else? email me. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Email What's your best email at, address? Um, Dasha, D-A-R-S-H-A. I did change the spelling on that one. Um, at beautyinstrength.com.au Awesome. I'll add that to the show notes, or Maddie will, because that's his job. <laughs> <laughs> and if they want to find you on Insta or f Facebook socials, what's your tags? Yeah, so best one to find um, me on Instagram is at dasha.mia, so D-A-R-S-H-A dot Mia, M-I-A. So that's the main one that I'm using now. Um, beautyandstrength.com.au for my website and Beauty and Strength for a Facebook page. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and 
empowering and inspiring so many, I mean, thousands of people. And you're just going to continue to go on to do great things. Amazing, thank you so much. I'm going to stop talking before we both start crying. So thanks for listening, guys. And uh, yeah, tune in again soon. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's still.